All right, so this presentation um, took the uh, part two of what I did for the Warren County Amateur Radio Club, but I've actually repurposed a lot of this from a presentation that I made back in May for an open source uh, organization called Kingston Open Source, and that's as in Kingston, New York. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, them and uh, all the cool things that they're doing, go and check out their website at kingstonopensource.org. They have a listing of all previous and upcoming presentations, and they even have some of the uh, slides and everything from things in the past. So definitely check them out if you're in the, uh, the New York area. And what's great about Kingston Open Source is it's not specific to amateur radio. If you're a maker, if you're a hacker, if you're just interested in doing cool things, definitely check them out. So I've used this graphic in quite a number of presentations over the years, and I think this does a, a pretty good job of just kind of explaining what different communications technologies can enable based off of looking at how long or how short they can go, as well as how much bandwidth they require. And so we have things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We know what those are. If you are not an amateur radio operator, uh, you might not be familiar with what ARDN is. Uh, this is a mesh network which uses repurposed Wi-Fi equipment reprogrammed to benefit amateur radio. And so you can create your own mesh networks uh, with AREDN, and you can go and do a search for that. And so that uses a lot more bandwidth compared to what many amateurs consider in VHF and UHF, uh, where we're typically using narrow band, maybe say 12 to 25 or so kilohertz, maybe even less. Um, and typically that's only going to, for the most part, go line of sight under few exceptions due to atmospheric conditions. But for the most part, you know, VHF and UHF have its purpose as well as what we do expect from Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and with something like mesh networking um, with Arden. Uh, then we have what we all use as consumers, cellular uh, networks, 3G, 4G, 5G. I should probably update this to uh, include 6G uh, coming up. We have at the bottom, we have the real narrow band things like HF, the 0 to 30 megahertz or shortwave uh, related communications for voice and digital and sending email over radio and all sorts of fun stuff. And then we have the example like bouncing signals off the moon, super niche, super cool, super long distance. Um, you also have low earth orbit and medium earth orbit satellites, or, or in some cases a geosynchronous satellite that can be used by amateur radio operators to relay communications. And then we come back to something like LoRa. So you can do a lot of different things with it. The key thing with LoRa is it's a great way to send data. So if you have sensors or actuators or RFID tags or any of these other things going on, there's a lot that you can do with LoRa technology. You can do chat, you can do location share, you can do all sorts of things. And all of this is all implemented thanks to so many different contributors within MeshTastic. So this is really how I would define what MeshTastic looks like. Uh, this graphic uh, you'll probably see on the MeshTastic website. So I think that's where I've uh, borrowed this. I'll point out here in the United States, the default channel is 906875. So that's where things default, and that's most likely where you're going to find most activity. If you start to fiddle with settings, that means that you're most likely not gonna find other users. So it's most important. If you don't know what you're doing, don't adjust things. At least start out with using MeshTastic on default channels because that's most likely where you're going to find people. But really, what is MeshTastic? It's, it's a series of devices that run the MeshTastic software, and that means that there's many different capabilities that you can create. So maybe you might have a small device, maybe a device that you pair to your smartphone. So in the case with, if you look at the left or the right, uh, you, the way that this works is you pair over Bluetooth your cell phone to a MeshTastic device. So you're using your smartphone as the ability to type in a message or view messages or send location or share location or see location. So you're using your smartphone as the input device. You also have other devices that are 100% standalone. So if looking at the left-hand bottom of the screen, see like a really cool looking device with a keyboard on it and an antenna, uh, you have standalone devices that do not need a cell phone, do not need anything, it's just 100% standalone, and that can communicate to any other MeshTastic device. You could also even take a computer, like a laptop, connect that to a, a MeshTastic device, and you can do that over Bluetooth. 
if you compare if you pair it that way. You can do it over Wi-Fi, or if you want it to be very clear that you're not using wireless, you can take a wire, connect it over USB from your computer to a mesh tastic device, and communicate to all others. And so that's basically what this is. Means that you can communicate from one device to another. That means that your signal could also bounce off of other devices to reach another recipient. And so that's really what's neat. It's low power communications that you can communicate to others directly and indirectly, depending on how other devices are uh, arranged um, as it relates to, uh, to LoRa. So as mentioned, there's lots of different form factors. If you're uh, into 3D printing, there's lots of uh, case options, or even if you want to design your own, but here's a couple uh, great examples. The only one on here that is not really 3D printed is the one all the way at left. You might see this if you go and do a search for Meshtastic on your favorite website like eBay or Amazon. Uh, you can buy uh, some of these devices in a pre-assembled basic case, um, or you can uh, 3D print your own, or you can buy them from uh, various uh, uh, people who have released their designs in public. So there's lots of ac uh, options if you wanted a specific color or something. Uh, there's lots of different options, but the key thing here is it's all the same software, and that makes it really easy uh, to make sure that everything is working. And there's a few different pieces of hardware, but for the most part, um, major devices are uh, supported through the same software, and that's what makes Meshtastic really neat. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. I'll do my best to uh, power through this. Um, when it comes to uh, low rock communications, you're not just looking at one frequency. There's other parameters that you need to program. And depending on how you do this, I like to think of them as like a recipe. Depending on how you assemble some of these different features like spread factor and bandwidth and coding rate, that means that you're either going to be able to transmit further or have a signal that's going to be less duration or more duration, depending on what you're trying to do. So if we use the topmost example on the top line, we have something that's gonna have better distance or reach with medium time on air, and that's going to be 125 kilohertz bandwidth and spreading out its spread factor at 12. Whereas then you have others that can be time on air really, really low. So if we go down to uh, the third line, you'll see that time on air is less, but it's not gonna go as far. And that's just based off of how the waveforms and everything are compiled. And so it's very important to understand how Meshtastic works um, from a technology perspective. But again, the real value with Mesh is it tries to kind of keep things very simple. So you'll know that there's a channel called like long fast. Uh, you'll see that in the documentation where We've already done all the hard work for you. So if you wanted to just get started and not have to worry about this, that's really one of the major benefits with Meshtastic is all the hard work has been done. We just want you to focus on using it and communicating and doing cool things. And so there's multiple different modes within Meshtastic. So I've grouped them into three different distinct areas. So we have client modes. So this is more like what you will be specifically using as an end user. So you can configure your device as client and there's three different types of client. So most people will use client, which means that it's app connected or standalone. So again, that means you're using this in conjunction with your smartphone or as a standalone. This means that you can send and receive messages to other users. They can send messages back to you. And then also your device can also reroute other communication in the local area. So the more users that you have in an area, the more reliable communication you get. So that's client mode, and then you have two other options, client mute, which basically means it's only gonna allow you to communicate with others, but it's not going to forward other messages. Then you have client hidden, which means that you're not gonna advertise yourself to others. So it's kind of a good way to monitor communications without anyone knowing. Then you have some other ones like tracker and lost and found, which are designed to share its location only and that might be helpful if you wanted to keep track of uh, an asset like a bicycle or a trailer or a dog or something, right? So you can do things with configuring these devices into tracker or lost and found mode. And then also you can even set it up as just sensor. So maybe if you wanted to connect a temperature sensor or um, some actuator or something, you can have it where it's not a human device. It's basically just sending back and forth 
specific data. So those are client modes. Then we have infrastructure modes. So in the amateur radio world, we have repeaters. Uh, in the case as it relates to MeshTastic, a repeater will relay information only. It's not gonna be visible as a node. So you might actually be in an area that has many repeaters. You might not know that they exist, but you might just think that you have better MeshTastic coverage in a particular area. But in actuality, it's these repeaters that are actually making that happen. That's different than a, a MeshTastic node configured as a router. So it will relay things, but then it's also gonna show as visible as a node. And so this way you actually know that there's equipment in there filling in the gaps. And so that's a very distinct difference between repeater and router. And then finally, we have these enhanced modes, which I'm really not gonna to spend too much time talking about. If uh, anyone wants to look into something called Android Tactical or ATAC, um, this enables through an API to use a really great piece of software that allows you to take a MeshTastic device and use it with uh, something like ATAC, ATAC Civil, or some of these other things, which are used by first responders or maybe people that are doing community response or search and rescue work. And so uh, you can look at that and um, they have their own little unique things. And again, you can go and look at all this documentation at meshtastic.org backslash docs backslash introduction. Very well documented project. That's the goal. One of the, the big things with MeshTastic is good documentation. But here's the problem. We have a big, big trouble. Challenges, we're in the 902 to 928 megahertz band in the United States. We have unlicensed and we have licensed amateur users. That's actually a problem. So what happens if an amateur radio operator who does have a license to transmit with higher power, what happens if they create a meshtastic node that is just like super high power because they have a license that permits them to do that? But what happens if they take one of their meshtastic devices, configure it as a repeater? They will be in trouble if they start relaying unlicensed users. And so that's a really big challenge to try to figure out is how can licensed and unlicensed users, or I should say licensed amateur users coexist. Um, so again, you know, being careful about that uh, regarding power levels. And again, if you're not an amateur radio license operator and you would like to maybe exceed your normal range and think how to do higher power while being mindful of the ISM uh, rules, uh, that's a great way to uh, think about becoming an amateur radio operator. But again, like I said, we cannot rebroadcast unlicensed users because we will violate our license. And a good solution to that is to have dedicated frequencies. And so maybe much like with the HasViolet project, maybe we start to see some amateurs think about having specific frequencies and there is already functionality within MeshTastic that allows you to enable something called amateur mode, which allows you to dial in any frequency versus the preset frequencies that MeshTastic has allocated. So not gonna really go through this. You can read this on your own, but these are some things that will impact the ability to deliver messages. And um, that's one of the challenges with Mesh. The more users that you have, the more it can clog up because you're relying upon others in your local area to store and forward messages. And so if you're adding other material to that, like data like telemetry from sensors or things like that uh, it creates some issues and so there's some cool functions in meshtastic that if you wanted to better understand how things work you can do like range test or read uh, details at uh, devices remotely so you can you can go and take a look at these my favorite um, is the detection sensor so that enables some really neat uh, neat use cases which you'll see in a moment so here we have a uh, a basic uh, use case. Here we have one device uh, based off of the Helltech uh, V3 hardware, which is very inexpensive. Uh, that was paired over Bluetooth to a smartphone. And then it was communicating to another same hardware that was plugged in via a USB-C wire. Um, and that allows somebody to use basically communications between a smartphone and a laptop with no internet because it's using two mesh-tastic nodes to create the connection. So that's uh, one use case if you're interested in off-grid messaging. Now, when you get into some uh, of the more deeper dive things, you'll start to notice in MeshTastic, there's multiple channels. Uh, everything is going to default to what's known as the primary channel. And there's a few parameters that you might want to consider not using. And here's the reason why. So the first question is, 
why is it a good idea to not use a pre-shared key on primary channel? So what I mean by pre-shared key is this is a form of uh, encryption. So if you're using a key, if you're using a key, everybody needs to have the same key. If you don't have a key, that means that none of those users will be able to know that they exist and communicate. So it's a really good best practice to not use a pre-shared key because chances are if somebody's new to Meshtastic, they don't know who you are and they can't get that key. So therefore, don't put a pre-shared key on your primary channel. Secondly, why is it a good idea to not name the primary channel? It defaults to primary. And again, if you change the name of the channel, the default is primary. If nobody knows what that channel is, they're not going to know that you're there. And therefore, you're not going to know that there's other users looking to communicate. So leave everything on primary as it's set to default. And finally, uh, there is a function called MQTT. It's best practice to leave this disabled. What MQTT means is that it's a mechanism that allows you to uplink or downlink information over the, over the internet, um, which is helpful. But again, if your goal is to have local communications, do not become dependent on MQTT because all of a sudden, if you see, for example, people in Texas appearing on your local network, that means that somebody has enabled MQTT and that means that you're backhauling information elsewhere over the internet. And again, that's not what I would consider off-grid messaging. So as mentioned, uh, these are some, some tips. So if you wanted to make a secondary channel and you can have up to uh, seven additionals, maybe you name one called Kingston. So maybe these are for people local. You find people on primary when they first find out a Meshtastic. You let them know, hey, we have a secondary channel. They program their radio to make sure that their secondary channel is named Kingston. And if they do that, then magically they will have access to that. Uh, same thing goes where if you wanted to uh, add a pre-shared key, you can do that. But again, you have to be mindful that if people don't have these parameters, they will not find you and you will not find them. Another example here is what if you want to have channels for, let's call it farm temperature. Maybe you want to have devices to be able to share back and forth soil acidity or moisture levels. You can dedicate channels specifically for different tasks. So if your goal is to only have sensors versus humans, you might want to allocate some channels specifically to that. And again, everybody's going to set these up differently. There's no uniform use. Channel four in one area is not going to be the same as channel four in another. So just be mindful of that. And again, how you program your mesh task device is going to be specific to you. Everyone else is not going to have it set up that way. But again, for the most part, if you stay with the same frequency as default and primary channel and nothing else has changed, I can guarantee that you will find other people to communicate with. If you make any changes, that will limit your ability to have a good user experience with Meshtastic. So in closing up, uh, here are some just simple use cases and show you the hardware. Here is an easy one where you take the board and you connect it to a GPS. So now you have a fully off-grid location enabled communications device. And there's many different cases that you can put these in. So the photo at the bottom, you see the Hiltec boards. There is a, a Tigo board. There's many things that you can do very similar. Some you could add a GPS to, others have it built in. So these are some really great ways that you can do some really cool things uh, for very inexpensive. And you could do a search for these uh, on your favorite uh, site like Amazon or eBay. And uh, here is a, uh, a use case on what I call a zombie detector. So this is taking some of that sensor fusion, integrating it and doing some neat things. And so let's say as a use case, you have a laser rangefinder which basically will detect any movement. It'll trigger an action to the board to say movement detected. Then it can send that as a message across the network to let others know that movement was detected by that particular node. And then you can have it do other things. Maybe you have it sound an alarm. Maybe have it blink a little LED. You know, you can do all sorts of things. And so this is not just something for communicating off grid by sending messages. You can do other things that are triggered so get creative, think about some of the functionality within Meshtastic and start to really do some fun things with that. And so in closing, you can go and do a search for this on your own MQTT. It's something that is going to rely upon parts of the internet. It's not 100% internet related. I'm just trying to simplify it. So again, if you want to understand about MQTT and Meshtastic, go and do some further searches on it. 
I, I would encourage you to understand more about the benefits of Meshtastic locally and wider than that. And in closing, thank you. There's so much that we can get into. But again, I wanted to draw the line, line somewhere. And so this is just meant to be a basic understanding of Meshtastic. And hopefully you've looked at some of the implications that Meshtastic has as it relates to the 900 and 2 to 928 megahertz band. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me a, a, a message. Or if you wanted to grab these slides, you can do so at the link at the bottom. So thanks again. Have a great day. And this is Steve K2GOG. I'll catch you next time.